background on the innovation process, we've had you do several assignments that um, get you thinking about that and allow me to understand um, how you're thinking about innovation and, and leading you into this iterative innovation process thinking as opposed to the linear one. And also, now that you understand incremental versus fundamental, we can uh, start to go into the phase of the class which I'll call uh, uh, innovation in the real world. And so, um, first in lecture nine, we'll talk about some examples that you're very familiar with, um, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, because there seems to be confusion about thinking of these kinds of examples, plus the examples of Intel, Microsoft, or previous industrial age innovation. And um, what I want to show you over the next few lectures is that any historical example or modern example obviously can be um, related to this innovation process we're talking about because the innovation process is based, as we've been showing you, on the human process of innovating. How do you um, evolve an idea over time in the context of reality to create a useful embodiment in the marketplace. So in this first lecture nine, we'll go through uh, these uh, familiar companies uh, and use our analysis to show how innovative they are um, or how incremental they are and uh, hopefully uh, give you a great perspective on that. Uh, in particular, we'll start off with Apple and Apple is very interesting because if you use a standard um, you know, new technology metric in the linear model for uh, Apple, uh, you can't explain its innovation, where if you use our model, you can. So we'll start there. We'll start off this first uh, part of Lecture 9 speaking about Apple. As I mentioned in the brief introduction, a, um, <laughs> Apple is particularly interesting because uh, it tests any kind of innovation model that uh, people think about. Uh, for example, if you're in the common linear model that we've discussed is incorrect, can you point to the fundamental technology that's really given Apple an advantage? And the answer is no. It certainly uses uh, pieces of new, nah, sort of new technology. Then you've got the group that says, ah, Apple is design. But of course, what is design? In our innovation process, design is the iterative innovation process because at the end, the thing that you have is an embodiment of the intersection of market application, uh, technology, uh, and implementation. And so design is literally uh, innovation in that sense. So uh, let's, let's actually look at Apple's products and use our model. And then you'll get to see both why Apple has been more innovative than most companies of late, uh, but not as innovative as companies in the past and while they'll be susceptible to easy encroachment by Samsung and others. So, um, as I've been saying, you know, I, I would think that the, you know, really interesting about Apple, because its stock price went up very fast and its products have spread very fast, you know, um, can we isolate ourselves from local fluctuations and identify whether it's incremental, fundamental, or, or of course, as we've mentioned several times in this class, uh, something that's in between. So I think one way to start is we could say, well, let's look at the final innovations that are in the marketplace. Uh, and, and, you know, the great thing about Apple is that it has a few of them. 
And so let's look at the Apple products that are actually there, which are the end result of innovation. And work backwards a little bit and ask uh, which products are the most innovative, uh, which are the most incremental, and we'll use our analysis uh, to do that. So the products that we want to look at, I think you're all very familiar with, but uh, there is the iPod. The iPod is particularly interesting because it is the uh, sort of beginning of the new Apple. If you might recall, uh, Steve Jobs was involved with Wozniak in the early uh, innovation paradigm of, of uh, microcomputers. Uh, as Moore's Law improved semiconductor chips, it was only a matter of time before people got together to find out what you can do with them. And one of the things you can do with them was to build a much smaller machine than a mini computer. What's interesting, of course, and you know this is um, along Christensen's work with disruptive innovation, but um, it's easy to understand with our model in the sense that um, you know, uh, the people that are involved in the mini computer revolution, which actually upended the large computer mainframe business, um, you know, they actually didn't see that you could shrink things further with the new um, semiconductors that were coming out because of Moore's Law. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, people um, in these clubs in California that were taking new chips and building things eventually converged on, on what we call today the personal computer. The first really commercial version of that was called the Apple II and the Apple II Plus was the real uh, market winner. And, and um, you know, in our language, the mini, the mini computer guys basically didn't open up uh, the application space and a technology space far enough to see that, um, you know, smaller computers had a place somewhere else uh, besides a business um, and that uh, the new semiconductor technology could give them enough power to address that market. And so the usual problem, because of course in those days not understanding the rate of innovation like we do today, um, they saw that um, they saw that that hey you know there is a mini computer market and we're going to stay focused on that, and we know what kinds of semiconductors need to be put in to that mini computer, and even though. The the semiconductors are getting more and more powerful. That's great. We put so many of them into our mini computers, it makes those more powerful. Why would you want to take a fraction of that and build a smaller computer? And of course, they couldn't anticipate different markets. And also how implementation would change because the cost of those machines uh, is a lot less. And I think people really missed the boat on miniaturization uh, in general would, would, because of the way things scale, reduce the cost of these devices. So um, through that whole cycle, eventually, um, as things were kind of maturing for Apple, uh, the usual thing happened. Investors, um, again, maybe re relatively uninnovative investors, uh, come in as the company is maturing and growing slow and say, what we need now is somebody who can just punch out a lot of the same stuff. And of course, not understanding the innovation process or people that can you know, actively manage that process like Steve Jobs could. I mean, Steve Jobs essentially could because he's doing the process we talk about in his head and then he could have other people kind of execute on it for him, uh, which is always not possible. You know, sometimes you need to have a group of people do the innovation process that we talked about as core innovators, not a single person. But anyway, the, um, uh, the iPod was when Steve Jobs came back, was asked to come back by other sets of investors to re-inject growth. Um, it was uh, the iPod that was the first product. That was followed by the iPhone, which was followed by the iPad. And so time is uh, moving along you know, uh, this path here. And it's kind of interesting to, first of all, analyze each particular uh, device and then see if there is a trend. You know, are we getting more innovative or less innovative as we, as we move forward? So let's start with the first one. What I've done here is kind of 
show you um, uh, our little model and looking at the starting point. And this is actually quite significant because um, uh, if you look at the iPod compared, so first of all, the iPod was not um, uh, the first MP3 player. So, you know, in the universe of MP3 players, there's already MP3 players that we need to think about. And there's other technology pieces in there. As we know, if you were gonna look at things, you would look at display, you know, user interface, both, uh, you know, mechanically software, or software, you know, dot, dot, and, and, and all these other things. And, um, and of course, from the MP3 player point of view, uh, Apple opened up, you know, the space broader than, um, than other, uh, uh, opened up the space broader than many other, um, uh, MP3 players, but this alone cannot explain Apple's success. So just because they make something a little bit uh, cooler and more interesting, um, is that the limitation of the innovation? Well, because we have our innovation model, we can go and we say, well, let's look at market. You know, is market really being opened up? Are there more options being looked at uh, from uh, compared to other MP3 players at the time? You know, is this really just the, you know, MP3 player market? The answer is that, as usual, um, uh, that is the main market, but I drew a separate little circle here because we do need to represent a little bit the fact that if you look at iPod growth, uh, they expanded, Apple expanded uh, the MP3, MP3 player market. And so, you know, this market uh, was a market that uh, pretty much was a device market and one could argue that Apple expanded it because uh, they went into folks uh, especially young people that wouldn't have normally bought um, a device and so they expanded a market that that you, know, you could say was sort of mp3 player um, alternative user market. So clearly Apple expanded the base of people that wanted an MP3, MP3 player by what they did. But in general, uh, this is not a huge, you know, I should have probably drawn this a little bit. You know, this is still basically the MP3 market. Yes, they expanded a bit, but it, it's, it's pretty much, you know, uh, the same market. You could argue the other way around that the previous MP3 players uh, were really targeting um, only people that wanted to use those specific kinds of devices and Apple you know opened it up uh, much more and the way that they kind of did that was really the key is the thing that was opened up much more and this is really the key that everybody forgets but our innovation model shows it which is that um, there were several directions that they looked at and how to pair the mp3 player um, with uh, implementation and so um, you know in here we have traditional model let's say and we've got traditional partners uh, and we've got um, uh, sort of new partners very importantly, uh, actually getting very close to music industry. Um, and then therefore opening up music business model. So if you look at a standard MP3 player, what people were doing was essentially um, oh, and you know you got to have all the manufacturing stuff in here. So you can think about it as you know in the in for a normal MP3 player company at the time, you know you had a single um, green dot basically, where uh, you don't go into other layers in the supply chain and you don't partner with anybody. And usually you just go have those people that make things make you another MP3 player. You put in a few new purple dots, and the market was this original 
MP3 player market. And so, you know, those companies had limited growth, they were doing incremental innovation. What Apple did was say, you know, we want to hit more people. The way we hit more people is we not only introduce a bunch of cooler things in technology, but the really key here is at the same time, they consider how the device can pair with different implementation factors. And actually by introducing this, and at the time, again, nobody's looking at innovation model, um, in a way, Steve Jobs caught them, the music industry, a little bit of a sleep. Asleep. They were desperate because uh, digital distribution of music was changing the industry rapidly. And what Jobs did was give them, a, 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 in their industry, some innovation, giving them a, a, a new implementation business model. But by considering all these things, and you know, by the way, Apple didn't know ahead of time this would all work. That's why I know there are several um, dots in here and some we probably don't even know about where they talk to various other partners. And so uh, by opening it up though, they were able to converge then on what we know today as you know the iPod, the iPod, but significantly remember the outcome of the implementation space is iTunes. So um, this is a, um, a a very innovative product, and um, also um, it um, uh, is not a fundamental innovation in the sense that uh, they had pretty much the MP3 player and that additional unaddressed market kind of uh, uh, from the start narrowed down. Uh, they weren't saying, oh, this might end up helping, you know, the TV industry, although actually I'm sure that was in here ironically, but um, my point is that it's not like some fundamental new um, integrated circuit that uh, makes other markets appear that we've never seen before that took 15 years to to work on, for example, right? So, uh, very innovative product because they opened up mostly technology options and uh, implementation options, and it converged on iPod and iTunes. Let's uh, uh, pause here, uh, and in the next segment, we'll talk about uh, the uh, the next two products. Uh, um, that we had mentioned, which are the um, uh, the iPhone and the iPad.